How you guys doing tonight? I mean today, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad to be here. First of all, I want to say thank you to the promoters of Invest Fest. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, are you guys having a good time? Yeah, learn a lot, hopefully. Uh, so like I said, this is a great, and I always tell people is that one of the biggest hacks in business, investing or whatever, is to just get in the building. And people don't understand the power of that. Is that if you're able to get around a group of like-minded people, you not only learn, but you also get exposed to new ideas that you may have never came up with on your own. So that's the power of coming to stuff like this. So like I said, you guys are here. That's a great step. So let's get one more round of applause for InvestFest. And so uh, today we're going to talk about tech savvy investing, right? So who, who, who knows me? So I don't How many people? <laughs> yeah. So. So, um, first of all, I do a disclaimer, man, so I don't want to get sued. So. <laughs> so, everything I talk about, right, is just my own personal beliefs, my own personal investing. Uh, so, it's just what I'm talking about. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a futurist, so I try to predict tech trends and capitalize or invest and make money or profit off of that, right? So, I'm not telling you guys what to invest in, so we all clear. Um, so, my background, I'm going to go over this real quick. Uh, so uh, I started uh, my tech journey. Uh, let's go back a little bit further. So uh, the, re the way I got into finance is that I come from Tennessee, a little bit, uh, four hours north there, a place called Clarksville, Tennessee. Anybody know Clarksville? Uh, it's near, <laughs> so about 40 minutes outside of Nashville. It's kind of mid, mid-sized city. Uh, so my mom was in the yard sales, right? She always go to these yard sales. And one day she came, I was like 18 years old, and she dropped this big box on me. So I got this box for $2. And at the top of the box, it was all these books I never heard of, but it was one book that changed my life. It was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, so, I, yeah, that's a great book. So if you haven't read that, I would I encourage everybody to read that book and then read my book second. So, <laughs> but, uh, so I read that book and I changed everything people told me all my life about money. It was completely different than what this, what this book was telling me. It was a, a totally different way of looking at money. Changed my life. So I went to college the next year. I studied computer science. Uh, so I, for a while, I, I, I was into that and I loved doing that. I got the opportunity after that to play basketball in Puerto Rico and a couple of other places for a year, uh, a couple of years. I wasn't that good at basketball. I was, I was a low level NBA, like pro player, right? So, but I got on the team, so I was, I was happy. <laughs> so uh, that career didn't work out. So I went back, uh, came back to the States. I did software engineering for a while. Uh, I, I got a job at a company uh, that would try to predict stock movements. And that's how I got into finance. Uh, so I, and I, and it opened up a whole new world to me. So then after that, I decided to go back to grad school and I studied uh, computer science again, but software uh, security, a specialization in cryptology. This was 2009. Now, that opportunity made me get exposed to something big, right, that was happening at the time. What was that? Anybody know? Cryptology, I was, cryptology is the study of inc computer encryption. And what, what's crypto mean, right? Crypt, cryptocurrency. It's currency that uses that encryption. That's all. I got in very early because I was just in the right place at the right time. So I ended up making a bunch of money on that. Uh, and then over the years, I started building ways to figure out how to predict which technologies are going to make a lot of money and which technologies are going to change society and how to invest uh, strategically and tactically and make the most money possible. We've been doing who's in the CNC first. Y'all been making a lot of money, right? <laughs> so that's good. So, uh, so yeah, so if you want to find me here, let me just put this up real quick. So uh, I'm on all the major platforms. Got an underscore uh, on, uh, on x.com. And also, I was a college instructor, so I'm going to do this like a college class. So I hope y'all don't mind that. So it's going to be more like, you know, like a, like a lecture. Yeah, so. So like I said, we want to talk about investing in the future. What this presentation is going to go over is how to identify trends, how to understand which trends are going to change society. And this is like AI. This is blockchain. This is all this stuff you hear about. And we're going to teach you how to find out early. How many of you guys heard about AI too late? NVIDIA too late? 
See, NVIDIA was a stock that went from $80 to $1,000 in less than two years. People made 11 times their money in two years because they were able to identify the trend early and buy the stock. Some people got Bitcoin at $100, $200, $300. It's $60,000 today. I think it's $60,000, somewhere around there. How did they know that, right? How are people able to get these investments at such a great price? It's because they knew about these tactics and this, these trends and these cycles that I'm gonna talk about over the next 30 minutes. So before we start investing in the future, emerging technology, so you always wanna practice risk management, right? So what risk management is, is that, uh, and it's, I'm gonna to explain to you. Uh, so if you're, who trades stocks, crypto, anything like that? I don't see a show of hands. So a lot of people in there, I'm, I'm assuming, right? So the problem with any kind of investing, like in assets, stocks, crypto, whatever, is that, you can be extremely good at trading. You can trade nine times and make three, four times your money each trade. If you don't practice risk management on the 10th, you lose everything and start back over from scratch. So it don't matter how good you are. If you don't practice risk management, that means protecting your profits and, protect, and protecting against losses, you end up losing everything anyway. So that's very important, that's why it's number one. Two is you have to understand the fundamentals of the company. That means how much the com money the company's making, how their management team is working, and a lot of other variables. So uh, I don't have time to get into that today, but you have to understand how these companies work long term. Two is you have to evaluate the market opportunities and all the potential of the particular industry or the sector. Four, diversification. Five is monitor industry trends. And six is if you want to, you can seek more professional advice. I have to say that because I'm not going to get sued. So. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about what emerging technology is. That's how I made all, most of my money. People in my group, is how they made their money too, uh, is that we're able to see these trends as they form uh, based on certain you know, trends, cycles, and patterns and able to put ourselves in position to make a lot of money. So emerging technology is any technology that comes out that will fundamentally change society, right? And now when we, when we hear about that, we think about AI, we think about uh, blockchain, but it could be something simple like the automobile was emerging technology in the early 1900s. That was something that changed the world. Uh, in, in the late 1800s, industrialization, when they came up with the factories and stuff to make things, mass produce items, that was also uh, emerging technology for those days, right? The textile, if you go back even farther, the textile uh, factories, when they were able to make you know, clothing uh, automated or automatic, that was another way that changed society was emerging technology. So in our time, the three biggest was a quantum computing, which is on the horizon, uh, two is blockchain and three is AI. So those are the ones we're gonna focus on in this presentation. So people, so, uh, so why should you care about uh, what we're talking about, right? It's because, how many of you guys have heard the term get in on the ground floor? Like you gotta get in on the ground floor. This is how you do it. Is that if you're on the ground floor, the profits are exponentially bigger than you being late to the party. So if you are able to get in early before the masses, that's when you make the most money. When the masses come into an asset, when the masses come into a stock crypto, it's too late. When your mama, your cousin, the barber shop are talking about, it's some smart barbers, I'm not going to say that, but, but, but you, you just in general, if people are talking about the assets or talking about this hot investment, it's probably too late. You have to get in before they get in. Those are the ones that, that almost like feed money to the market so the rich people get richer. So, uh, let me see, he's coming in. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so is it better now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's on. Uh, is it better now? Uh, okay, so let's see. So, okay, so, uh, so you should care about it because this is how the rich get richer. They're able to use inside information, use knowledge of these trend cycles to get into these investments before anybody else can, and you can profit by investing in these technologies before they go mainstream. So, like I said, we're gonna, do, we're gonna talk about three game-changing techniques to do this, right? Is one is timing your investments by understanding how curves and bubbles work, recognizing and acting on market cycles, and diversification, uh, and strategic investment approaches. So like I said, this is the goal is to equip you with the knowledge to make informed decisions and get into these markets before the masses. We always got to be in before everybody else. As soon as everybody else starts talking about it, it's, it's nine times out of ten too late. And I ask the most with everything because society is not 
created or de designed for everybody to be rich. And I know that's hard to hear, but it's, 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 so it has to be classes. And that's how the United States is made up. So everybody can't get rich. So only a certain percentage can get rich. And those are the ones with the knowledge to get into these things early. So we're gonna talk about something called the technology adoption curve. And that's what this means is that when a new technology comes out like AI, or blockchain, or even like automobiles, electricity, uh, cell phones. Uh, if anybody's around 40 years old, you remember when cell phones hit the scene, right? Uh, around 2000, and all of a sudden everybody had phones, right? So before that, it was like only the ballers and the rich people had phones. But up until around 2000, 2001, everybody started getting phones. So it was a, there's a reason why that happened. And I'm gonna explain it to you, right? Is that whenever a new technology comes out, uh, and right now we're in the, in the metaverse. That's, I'll tell you where we are right now. But whenever a new technology comes out, uh, there's people called innovators. And they get on the technology first. So those people like to tinker. They don't mind if it's a little clunky. They don't mind if the technology doesn't work 100% or if it's extremely expensive. They just want to be the ones that has it, have it first. They want to be the ones that say, hey, I got this before everybody else. Or I knew about it before everybody else. Those people... That's normally about two and a half percent of the market uh, they get into this. So everybody have, probably has a friend like this that, ha that wants to get into technology before everybody else. It's about two and a half percent of the society, right? So what comes next is the early adopters. So they see these tinkers and these innovators uh, with this technology and then they come. It's about 14 percent of society. And then they want to be the ones that have the technology before the masses. So those are the ones who are normally adjacent or close to or friends with the innovators uh, and they want to get it. So they want to make sure they see the value in the new technology and they're willing to pay for it before everybody else. So three is early majority, right? And that means that's 30, that's 33% uh, of society, right? That's the early majority. So right now we're at about 50, 60% in of uh, people who own or are aware of the technology, right? And then it's the late majority. That's people who come onto the technology after they saw everybody with it, they were forced to. That's like me with the iPhone. I didn't get an iPhone in like a year and a half ago. And people like, they just like airdrop this to me. I still don't like, here man, you gotta do it. I, I had an Android up until now. But it was a reason for that. I just didn't like Apple because of something that happened a long time ago. But <laughs> it, was, it wasn't because of the phone, it was because I just didn't like how they did stuff, so. And then the laggards come, right? Uh, the laggards are like my mom, right? My mom, when the internet came out in the late 90s, uh, she said it was the devil. <laughs> now, remember, I'm from Tennessee, the Bible Belt, right? <laughs> so uh, she said, look, the internet's the devil. I don't want y'all on there. Uh, but now my mom has an iPad, an iPhone. She got uh, a laptop. She watches, she streams on Netflix. You, know, you see, now she's a laggard. So she was... The last to find, and she just started this like three years ago in the pandemic, right, four years ago, she just started. So these, this is a laggard. This is somebody who takes 20 years to accept the technology. By the time these people come, the investment potential is over. It's completely done. The internet, you can't invest in the internet no more, it's over. Right, you had to do it 20 years ago. So you have to know where you are in the adoption curve and know what type of people are adopting the technology to know what the potential is for investment. So uh, I just want to talk about how adoption takes time uh, because a, a lot of times with technology, uh, all of a sudden, like what I said with cell phones early on, it, all of a sudden it seems like it's everywhere. Like all of a sudden everybody had AI, right? Who, who feels like AI just came out of nowhere, right? But it didn't. It's been going on for 30 years or well, 50 years almost. So what happens is that it, it, during those first three parts of the first two parts, it's, society doesn't see it because they're tinkers, innovators, it's messing with this technology. So we don't see it until it, the early majority starts to get in. Uh, but a lot of the investment potential is gone by it. So, for example, personal computers took 20 years, over 20 years to be adopted uh, by 70, 80% of society. Personal computers came out in the late 70s. But how many of you guys had a PC in your home or a laptop? What year? 2000, 2005? So it took a while to do that, right? Especially me, I didn't have one until like 2003. Automobiles took 50 years before everybody accepted them. Electricity took 50 years also. So I want to show you this chart. We talked about how 
each, sec each section of that uh, adoption curve starts to, uh, accept, uh, starts to accept technology. But if you, at the bottom, you'll see what the returns are by investing at that part of, uh, of the cycle. At the innovator stage, that's high risk, high reward. So if you have a friend that, te you see somebody tinkering with some new technology, it's something that could possibly change society. You know, only a few people in it now. It sounds like it's clunky, it's not gonna, wor not gonna work. The media is saying that it may fail. That may be a good chance to get into that. Where to people, you ever hear about people getting into stocks pre-IPO, startups, they're the ones that make 100 times their money. Because they get like Uber, right? Uber, when it started back in, in 2010, 11, people, Jay-Z, uh, Beyonce, they made 100 times their money on that uh, because they got in early. Uh, a lot of celebrities, I think uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio got in early because they saw the potential, got in before everybody else understood it. Oh, that's not going to beat the taxis. That's not going to, that Uber's never going to work. Back when, in that phase, when it was just in San Francisco, California, it wasn't all the way around the world like it is now, that's when they made 100, 200, 300 times their money. I think, and I, I don't know these numbers, but I believe like 30% of Jay-Z's wealth is off Uber stock. It's like 20, 30%. If that makes him a billionaire off one trade. He put like, I think he, he did a, some kind of transaction, but he's like a million, he started with a million and that million turned into like 200 million off of one trade because he got in early. So he actually made more than that. Probably he, he like, probably music, I guess. I don't, I don't know the numbers, but probably. Uh, then you have the early adopter stage. That's when these second people, second phase of people come in. Rewards start to drop or returns start to drop. It's now it's 10 to 50 times, which is still a lot of money, right? It's a lot of money. Uh, so then we go into, this, this is what's called a chasm, right? What a chasm is between those first two, first two parts and the last two parts, there's a gap where nothing seems to be happening, right? And right now that's happening with the metaverse. Who remembers when everybody's talking about the metaverse like three, four years ago, around the pandemic, right? So during that time, uh, innovators got involved, early adopters got involved, then it disappeared. It seemed to disappear, right? But you hear, conflicting reports. You hear Meta's putting $100 million into it. You hear Microsoft is invested. And a lot of times you're thinking like, why would they invest in a dead technology? Because they're not. Because we're in that phase of the uh, adoption curve where it's, it's, it seems to be forgotten. And then a year or two from now, the early majority will come in. And then the late majority will come in. Then 10 years later, 15 years later, the laggers will come in. Technology always happens like this. It's happening right now with blockchain. It's happening with AI. At first, it always seems like it's not gonna work. It's too expensive. It always messes up. And then over time, it gets better and better, faster, more efficient, cheaper. And then one day, it just comes into our lives and we start using it. And then it was, a, it was maybe 10 years before that where the potential to make a lot of profit was huge, but we didn't understand what was happening. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this today. And then you got the, la by the time the laggers come in, uh, all investment potential is gone, so I didn't even put them on here. So it's just innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority. So uh, I want to talk about another concept before we move on, it's called a bubble. Who's heard of a bubble? Stock bubble, crypto bubble. Uh, a bubble has negative connotation, right? Like it seems to be bad. But I want to explain what it is uh, so it won't be so scary. Uh, so with a bubble, uh, Normally when a new technology, new concept comes out, uh, something happens, it's a cycle that happens. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on it right now. Is that uh, a lot of the rich people, the organizations, the banks, they get into this asset. It could be like uh, AI, like with NVIDIA or whatever. And they buy it up when it's cheap, right? And then as time goes on, more and more people learn about it. And then the, you know, the second wave and the third wave comes in. Everybody keeps making money, money, money. And then eventually, uh, the masses figure it out. And they're like, man, everybody's making money on, on AI, or everybody's making money on Bitcoin, or everybody's making money on, on some crypto. And they come in. Now, these people at, at this point in the, in the, uh, at this point in the, you know, in the investment, they really don't have a lot of knowledge. They're just coming into it because somebody told them to come into it. So they're not really savvy investors. So the first people start selling, you know, to make, the, to lock in profit. So, after a while, 
uh, at, at some point in that investment, maybe in the first two phases, uh, the stock or asset got to what the real price was. Let's say $100, like a stock got to $100. That's the real price of the stock. It's $100. Stocks have real fundamental value based on how the company's doing. So that, that may be what it is. And then when that third phase of people come in, the masses, they come in because of hype, because of FOMO. And they push that stock up to two, three, four, five hundred dollars It's like $300 higher than it should be anyway. And then once the rich, the elite, they get out of the, the stock or asset or crypto or whatever, uh, now there's nothing holding it up. So it, it crashes down to what the real price was anyway. And that's what a bubble is. It's not even that bad. <laughs> it just goes back down to what the mean or the real price is. That's all it is. So I just wanted to explain it before we move on. And this is how a bubble works in, uh, in the chart of the bubble, right? And I want to explain uh, how this works. So if you look at this chart, there's four phases. I can't It's stealth, awareness, uh, can't read that. and then the last is a blow-off phase. Uh, so we just talked about the first two, but if you see on the second phase, on the institutional investors, you see a, 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 it goes up a little bit and drops down. Uh, that's what people are expecting a bubble to happen. Uh, because everybody knows bubbles happen. They all, everybody knows everything gets built up and it crashes. We all know that. So like in AI, for example, with NVIDIA, uh, people are expecting NVIDIA to one day have a bubble or AI in general to have a bubble and they're expecting it to crash, right? So I think that's what's happening with NVIDIA right now. We're at that first part and NVIDIA is going to keep going up and a lot of these other AI stocks are going to keep going up. So, but this, is the, this chart is, every time you look at a stock or a bubble, or, or crypto or whatever, it's always like this. It's always like this. 90% of the time, the chart looks exactly like this. Goes up, there's a fake sell-off, the institutional investors get back in, and then there's a public, uh, ma the masses get in, it goes into exponential growth, comes down, it crashes back down to that, that dotted line is where the mean was or the real value was. It drops below the real value, then it comes right back to the real value. It happens like this every single time. If you're able to see this pattern, you can make a lot of money. This pattern happens every single time. If you look at Bitcoin or crypto over the last 20 years, uh, well, it's not that long, uh, 13, 14 years, uh, you'll see this pattern over and over and over again. Every four years, the same thing happens. The chart looks exactly like this. And I encourage you guys to look at it after this. It looks exactly like this every four years. So we're going to talk about market cycles and why these things happen. So uh, we were, market cycles refer to trends or patterns in markets. Uh, it could be real estate, it could be crypto, it could be stocks, it could be equities, it could be anything. It it's the same thing across all markets. Uh, at different stages, uh, different assets respond differently to this market cycle. And new market cycles form in different assets based on different things. In crypto, it's because, a new four-year cycle starts because of the Bitcoin halving. Who's heard of that? So the Bitcoin halving is an event that happens every four years. Bitcoin supply gets cut in half, new supply gets cut in half, and it triggers a four-year cycle that looks just like that chart that we just showed on the screen. So market cycles have four distinct phases, uh, accumulation, markup, distribution, and downtrend markdown. So it's really important to know these four. This is actually the most important thing you should take from this presentation because it applies to all markets. It applies to real estate, it applies to crypto, it applies to stocks, anything where you put money in and try to make a profit, same thing happens over and over and over again. So cycles exist in all markets, uh, sorry, cycles exist in all markets. The key here is the smart money, the banks, the elite, the rich, the institutions, they buy in at the first phase, the accumulation phase. And like you, you're probably asking, how do I know I'm in accumulation phase? Let me tell you how. Uh, every market has that four year cycle. We talked about that chart, how it goes up, comes down, and then it stops. And that chart repeats itself every, four, every, uh, every cycle. So, when an asset drops a certain amount, right, and it could be real estate in New Orleans, it could be Bitcoin or three, four years ago, it could be AI, maybe in a year or two, it doesn't matter what it is, is that the people that come in at the end tend to panic. 
because they're low information, uh, non-savvy investors. And the rich people know that. So what happens at the end of a cycle, and one of the reasons, and I'm sorry, the end and the beginning of a new cycle, one of the key indicators is that the media will tell you that it's over. Don't they think about that? Uh, and who's old enough to remember uh, Hurricane Katrina? Uh, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember it. Uh, and Hurricane Katrina, uh, I remember all that happened. And I remember them standing on the, uh, near the, where the levees broke and stuff like that. And they're like, this place will never be the same. It's over. It will never be rebuilt. And they were talking about how like chemicals seeped into the ground and they could, that land is unusable for 50 years. And now you go to that same area, what does it look like? So that's the media preaching doom and gloom. Now the media is always behind on information. And the reason they are because they're journalists. They're, they're reactive, they're not proactive. So they're always behind. And they're always gonna tell you, oh, this is over, or they can't, they don't wanna tell you what's next, they tell you what happened. So they're always behind. So anytime the media is preaching doom and gloom about an asset, that, and then you also see conflicting reports in the media, about corporations, banks, elite buying the same asset, that's the main indicator that you're in accumulation phase. Like for example with crypto, right? Who's into crypto? Who knows JP Morgan is getting into Bitcoin? Who hears that, uh, that BlackRock has bought ridiculous amounts? All these huge bank investment banks that have think tanks of hundreds of people that PhD level uh, economic, uh, people that are in economics. And they're buying up crypto. They're buying up uh, a lot of crypto assets. Right. And, and on the other hand, you hear people saying, oh, yeah, crypto is still a scam. It's a Ponzi. These are conflicting reports. They don't make sense. It's because we're in accumulation phase, the first phase. Right. That the rich, the elite and the banks are accumulating that asset because they know what's coming next. Right. Then the second phase is a markup. Right. And now markup, we know we're in markup. And I'll tell you why. It's because those assets or those stocks or that crypto, whatever it is, will be marketed directly back to you. You'll go into your bank and they'll have signs up. Now we do crypto trading. Or you'll be on your cash app and a thing will pop up and say, now we're, you can buy crypto here. And you'll see these things and you're like, well, that's kind of weird. About a year ago they told me that it was a scam. Now they're selling it right back to me. That's the second phase, that's markup. That's because the banks, the leading rich, have already got their stakes at very low prices. Now they have to have, find a group of people to sell it back to. And they have to increase awareness and increase uh, pe the people that know about the asset. So it's not like they don't sit in a room and plan this out. It just happens, right? Then the third one is distribution, right? So after the banks leading the rich, they go on the news and talk about it. They talk about the asset they just bought, you know, a year or two years ago. Uh, they move into the third phase, distribution. Now, distribution means that everybody starts to get it. That's when I talked about earlier about your aunt, your cousin. Your mama start calling saying, oh, I heard about Bitcoin, should I get into that? The more people, like I always do this, I say, I pick somebody in my life that I think would never talk about something like this. You know, and I say, if that person ever calls me and asks me about it, then it's all, I got to get out. <laughs> and and it, without fail, it always happens, right? Uh, and another sign is that um, a lot of influencers that didn't even talk about this all of a sudden start talking about it. And everybody... It's too many people talking about it. Like we said, everybody can't get rich. So if too many people are saying they're getting rich on something, it's not going to happen. You got to get out or either you got to be willing to wait for the next four year cycle. It's two choices. You can go ahead and sell and take your profits or you got to be willing to take a drop. And when it comes back, you you know, hold it for the long term. That's your two choices in that situation. Uh, and the last one is markdown. And that's when you see the huge drops in stocks to asset market crashes. Uh, and stocks and crypto, real estate crashes. That's, that's when the doom and gloom from the media starts coming back. It's over, it'll never be the same. 2008, remember that? Uh, the mortgage crisis? They told us that housing would never be the same. The United States was over. Where are we at today? Houses are five times more expensive <laughs> than they were back then. I bought a house then like, for like 120, it's worth like 700,000 now. Uh, so they were pre preaching gloom and doom back then. We were in that last part in 2008. They told us that it was never going to be the same. Mortgages were done. Like everybody, the whole United States was failing. Now look at us. The mortgage or the real estate market is better than it's ever been right now. So those are the four cycles, or four stages of the cycle, I'm sorry. 
So everybody's listening to this. Some people just walked in. They're probably saying, like, how can this benefit me? And I always try to make sure I present information that benefits people, right? So you can take this and make some money or just learn or get some knowledge or maybe use it somewhere. So the reason why is because, like I said, we are, we've said some of these things before, is that the smart money buys at the first phase. If you know that you're in the first phase, which is accumulation, you can use that to get into the markets early, right? And the smart money starts to sell, like we said, at the end of markup or beginning of distribution. And in a smart investors who recognize all four of these are the ones who normally do the best, and they're the ones that profit the, uh, the, the you know, the greatest, I should say. And the ones that don't know about it normally get tricked into coming in doing distribution, which is the worst cycle to get involved because it's their market top. And if you don't know these things exist, all you know is that I was sitting in the barbershop and everybody was talking about Bitcoin. So maybe I should get into it. You see what I'm saying? Because you don't understand where you are in the market cycle. So you get into it, the next day it crashes, and you say, oh, I mean, that was a scam anyway. You sell it. And you'll do this over and over and over again if you're unaware of this four-phase cycle. If you're unaware that it's happening, you'll just keep coming back in in the third phase, distribution. distribution because that's when you start hearing about it. Playing basketball, you're at the gym, you hear about it, so you think, well, this, maybe this is the time. And you keep coming in at the bad time, and you sell at the worst times. That's why people do that. It's because they continuously are in the wrong part of the cycle. So I want to talk about, i got like eight minutes, but... Actually, so I want to talk about these, how we can apply what we talked about to three technologies uh, that either are changing society now or they're going to change society. Now, um, one is two of them are already doing it, AI and blockchain. So artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, and a lot of other stuff are changing a lot of stuff in our society. Who's using ChatGPT right now? It's, it's good, right? <laughs> Saves a lot of time, effort. It makes things faster. I would encourage everybody in here, I don't care what you're doing, to start getting into ChatGPT. It can make whatever your job or if you're an entrepreneur, it can make, uh, it can 10 times whatever you're doing. If you're learning, it's another application out there called Zapier. You should research that too. It's an automation tool, but you can use ChatGPT with Zapier and you can automate a lot of stuff like email responses, negotiation with clients, you can send for them, you can do a lot of stuff. So I encourage, I wish I could talk about that, but you guys should. Uh, uh, Z-A-P, uh, I think it's I-E-R. So, uh, so the three, and the third is quantum computing, and that's gonna change everything. We're a little bit uh, ahead on that, maybe about five years. Who's heard of quantum computing? Now that's gonna change the world because what, uh, right now, computers are limited by time, right? That means that if I give the computer a set of instructions or a set of data to process, it has to do it one at a time. I mean, it does it extremely fast, like billions of times a second, but nevertheless, it has to do one at a time. So with quantum computers, no matter how big the information is, no matter how big, it does it all at once. So it's millions and millions of times faster than a traditional computer. The computers that exist in your phone, your watches, your laptops, your iPads, your car, all of that is classic computers right now. Quantum computers will be millions or even billions of times faster than classic computers. And that's what's coming on the horizon. That's like, we're like five years from now. Uh, and we're gonna talk about two, techno two uh, techniques to invest in emerging tech. I've got like six minutes, so I gotta speed up. Uh, so the biggest one is the pick and shovel strategy, right? So if we can target or we can see something like quantum computers or blockchain or AI starting to integrate into society and start to uh, be adopted by society, we can use the pick and shovel strategy. Back in 1849, uh, there was a gold rush in San Francisco. In that gold rush, people got there, found a lot of gold, became millionaires. That news spread all over the United States. And then what happened is that everybody read the news, what happened? So they, came, they all wanted to go to San Francisco and get that gold. But the smart people realize there's too many people coming to get the gold. How do we make the money? We make the money by selling the picks and the shovels. We make the money by selling the people that's coming next, the food, the houses, the clothes, everything they need to, to look for that gold. And we're gonna be the next set of millionaires, and they were. That's called the pick and shovel strategy. You find a trend, you find something that's happening in society, and you get on that supply side. You figure out what this trend needs to get, to get to where it's going. With AI, it was NVIDIA. 
AI had to have those chips in order to be, get where it's at today. NVIDIA was the only company on earth at the time that could make the chips at that capacity, at that quality. They were almost guaranteed to go up 10 times in 2022. And, uh, and that's because it was a pick and shovel play. We found somebody that had to supply the trend. And two is a more conservative strategy, it's called index investing. Is that you can find technology indexes. Uh, there's some on just general technology, there's some on AI, there's some on blockchain technology. And what these indexes do is they, they do the work for you. They find a bunch of stocks and assets that are already you know, invested in this technology and they diversify it for you. They put it into like a basket and you buy part of the basket. So you're able to uh, diversify and invest in a concept instead of an in individual stock or asset. So a lot of people to, uh, like to do that as well, do that. So we talked about pick and shovel. So I want to talk about a few opportunities. We've got like four minutes. Uh, blockchain opportunities, uh, we talked about pick and shovel. We talked about being on the supply side and platforms, right? Is that blockchain, I, I still feel like, and I'm not a financial advisor, nobody sue me, but I think blockchain is going to do well over the next 18 months. Coinbase is a platform. They supply, uh, they supply people with crypto. Uh, so they normally do well in this cycle. CleanSpark is a miner. So they mine Bitcoin, they, their profits go up as Bitcoin goes up. Bitcoin and Ethereum are direct investments into the concept. Uh, artificial intelligence, we know NVIDIA. I don't think it's over. I think it, it, artificial intelligence has a long way to go. Uh, you got Intel, they both produce uh, chips uh, that AI needs in order to grow. Uh, CrowdStrike is a, a security company that uses AI to uh, to do both hardware and software security. Palantir is an AI company, they also have government contracts. They're on the software side. So AI software development, advanced hardware. Uh, quantum computers, they, it, quantum computers, and when we talked about uh, the adoption cycle and where technologies are, quantum computers don't work yet. They, uh, it's mostly theory, but some companies like Honeywell uh, do have like, like very rudimentary quantum computers and they're working on it, but that's the where the investment potential is that get in now. Because you get in later, oh, I'm gonna wait until, it's like a bad neighborhood, right? You wanna get into a neighborhood as it's building up, as, as it's changing, as it's getting better. You don't want, once all this stuff gets there, it's too late. So you gotta get into it early. So right now is the time uh, to get into that. So in Amazon Web Services is always good. And we talked about Nvidia and Intel. Uh, we talked about that, we talked about diversification. Uh, we can skip that, so we we'll skip to this. So, how to find me again? Uh, underscore tall guy tycoon at x.com. I was gonna take questions, but they wouldn't let me, so I apologize. Uh, Instagram, tall guy tycoon. YouTube, tall guy tycoon. Also, I'm having a book signing at my booth, 513 at 2 o'clock, and that book talks about these, this, these concepts in greater detail. So, if you're interested, come by. Um, and thank you guys for having me. I appreciate you. I hope you learned something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like this?